COVID-19 from the front lines. What actually COVID-19 has taught us about the healthcare emergency responses. We have a esteemed panel of policymakers, medical professionals, and public health experts uh, from across the globe again to discuss the challenges that lay ahead in combating COVID-19 and what it means for emergency health responses. With that, uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to introduce our uh, uh, esteemed panel. To begin with, uh, Dr. Altaf Lal, uh, who will moderate this session. Uh, Dr. Altaf Ahmed Lal is a senior advisor for global health and innovation at Sun Pharma. He holds a postdoctoral degree in biochemistry. He previously served as the U.S. Department um, of Health and Human Services representative of South Asia. US FDA Director of India Office and the Chief of Molecule Vaccine Section of Parasitic Diseases at the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. He serves on the board of the Rollback Malaria Partnership Board, Asia Pacific Leaders Malaria Alliance, and Foundation for Disease Elimination and Control of India. Thank you so much, Dr. Altaf Lal, for joining us. I think it's this is this panel is going to be really, really power packed. Um, I'm happy to welcome our speakers for uh, this particular panel discussion, Dr. Faisal Sultan. He is a special assistant to the Prime Minister of Pakistan on health. Dr. Sultan is an infectious disease physician and has previously served as a member at the National AIDS Control Program in Pakistan, Medical Research Council, and Pakistan Science Foundation, among other prominent boards. Uh, it's completely our honor to have you here with us, Dr. Faisal Sultan. We also have with us uh, Dr. K. Srinath Reddy, who is the president at Public Health Foundation of India. Dr. Reddy previously headed the Department of Cardiology at the prestigious uh, All India Institute of Medical Sciences. He was appointed as the first Bernard Lang Visiting Professor of Cardiovascular Health at the Harvard School of Public Health. And presently, uh, Dr. Reddy uh, serves as the Adjunct Professor of Epidemiology at Harvard. Dr. Reddy holds an MD and DM in cardiology from AIMS. Thank you so much, Dr. Srinath Reddy, for being here with us. Uh, completely our pleasure and honor. Dr. Sarthak Das is the next speaker for this panel, uh, who's the CEO at Asia Pacific Leaders Malaria Alliance. He brings 25 years of experience as a public health scientist, development practitioner, and global health policy advisor. He previously served as regional director for Southeast Asia Pacific at the Clinton Health Access Initiative as Chief of Policy and Public Sector Partnerships for Partners in Health, where he was engaged in the West African Ebola outbreak in 2014 and 2015. Thank you again, Dr. Sarthak, for joining us, for taking our time, for joining us in this, uh, our fight for uh, misinformation in medicine. The next speaker for this panel is Martina Kesser, who is a policy advisor at Global Health Conrad Edener Foundation. She previously served as the coordinator for public relations and the international media program in the European and International Cooperation Department and as a consultant for the European policy. Thank you, Martina, for being here. Our next speaker uh, for for this session is Simon Bland, who is the CEO of Global Institute of Disease Elimination in Abu Dhabi. He previously ran the New York office of UN AIDS and was a senior civil servant in the British government's Department for International Development. Thank you, Simon. Thank you again for joining us here. Uh, we also had in our panel Dr. Paul Rotter, uh, who could not join us uh, uh, today because of a health emergency um, uh, back here. Uh, so uh, you'll be missed, Dr. Paul. But with that, I think I will now hand it over to Dr. Altafla. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you, Surbi, for those kind words of introduction uh, to the panelists. Uh, let me also add my thanks to Tariq and Joey, uh, who have held hands over the last several days and got us here. So thank you to all of you. I would also like to add my thanks to Srinath, Simon, Faisal, uh, Martina, and Sertak for joining me today uh, for this uh, very important session on COVID-19. Um, what 
each one of them brings to this uh, session is decades of experience in biomedical sciences, health sciences, public health at program level, at operational research level, in policy level. It's this combination of experience that makes this panel extremely rich. Um, and I know the audience that is either listening in or watching us today would find the conversation and discussion extremely useful. Um, there's one thing that's common uh, in our work products, which is we use peer review data and scientific evidence to make assessments and interpretations. Um, and since some of you in the audience may have joined specifically for this session, I would like to take a moment and share with you some information on terminologies disinformation, misinformation, and malinformation. I think it's important for all of us to be um, on the same page as we go for the rest of the session. Disinformation is, is content that is intentionally false and designed to cause harm. It is motivated by three distinct factors, to make money, to have political influence, either domestic or foreign, or to cause trouble for the sake of it. When disinformation is shared, it often turns into misinformation. Misinformation also describes false content, but the person sharing it does not realize that he or she is misleading others by spreading this information. Often a piece of disinformation is picked by someone who does not realize it is false and shares it with their networks believing they're helping. Malinformation is genuine, such as someone gets access to emails of a person and leaks them or fake, such as the present narrative, especially in the United States. And when it's shared, with an intent to cause harm. With that introduction, um, let me go to the first slide. And I want to set the stage here, take us back to the 1918 pandemic, 1918, 1919 pandemic. Globally, there were about 500 million cases, uh, which was about uh, 28, 29% of the population then. It is estimated that pandemic caused about 50 to 100 million deaths, which was between 2.8 to 5.6 percent of the world population. Now, this is where the misinformation piece starts beginning in. Spanish flu has been used to describe the influenza or flu pandemic of 1918. And therefore, the name suggests that the outbreak started in Spain. But that was not the case. The nations involved in World War I did not actually report their flu outbreaks. Newspapers in Spain reported more openly about influenza cases. So the narrative in the rest of the world was Spanish flu. It was later reported that the first infection was identified in March of 1918 at an army base in Kansas in the United States, where 100 soldiers were infected within a week, and the number of flu cases grew fivefold, and soon the disease took hold across the country. But as we have now, the use of masks also stoked political divisions. Then, as now, Medical authorities urged the wearing of masks to help slow the spread of disease. And then, as now, some people resisted. In the context of India, at that time, British India, um, it was the pandemic was referred to as Bombay influenza or Bombay fever. And the pandemic is believed to have killed up to 18 million people. Most mortality in Bombay, followed by Madras and Calcutta. In this slide on the upper right hand corner, you will see three peaks. I want you to keep in mind these three peaks, even though these are peaks showing mortality, 
but see the separation between three peaks, how the mortality dropped down to close to zero. The next slides will show you where we are today in 2020 pandemic. United States as a nation leading the number of cases and leading the number of deaths. Globally, we have about 55 million cases and around 1.3 million deaths. And the people who died and people who are dying are mothers, their fathers, their grandparents, children, and friends and co-workers. They are law enforcement officers and they are also healthcare providers. If you combine on this slide, India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan, the combined number reaches about 10 million. So what we see now is also something that we saw in 1918-1919 pandemic. The next slide will show you where we started um, going wrong in the narrative. But before I do that, I wanted to go back to the comment I made about healthcare workers. Globally, about 2,300 healthcare workers have died due to COVID. And about 70% of them are actually people above 50 years of age. Now starts the disinformation. The President of the United States in a rally in Michigan says that our doctors, i.e. the doctors in the United States, get more money if someone dies due to COVID. The statement President made was not correct, but many of his followers may have believed him, perhaps did believe him, and some may have further communicated through their networks in doing this falsehood got converted into intent to harm. Next slide, please. So what helps? Like in 1918 and 19 pandemic, masks work. I'll give you two examples. First is an example that was published in MWR recently, where in Springfield, Missouri, Two hairstylists developed respiratory symptoms. They followed the city recommendation of use of face covering. After public health contact tracing and two weeks of follow-up, no COVID symptoms were identified amongst 139 exposed clients. This finding supports the role of source of source control in preventing infection. Masks work. Physical distancing on top of that has additional benefit. Hand washing will have a third layer of benefit. An analysis done by the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, University of Washington concluded, this was a couple of months ago, that 130,000 lives could have been saved in the US alone if 90% of population wore masks. So then we need to ask ourselves, and policymaker and political leaders need to ask as well, why should we not have a national directive on wearing masks? Very similar to the national mandates everywhere in the world of wearing seat belts. Next slide, please. A few more examples of misinformation and misconnected information. The term misconnected information is something I'm just introducing now. Misconnected information to me is if someone says half truth, but confuses the audience or irrelevance makes irrelevant responses and comments and confuses the audience. Let me share with you some of the comments that were made and reported either by credible news outlets or comments made by the leaders themselves. A claim was made that coronavirus was retreating in one country because of cosmic level sound waves created by collective chair of citizens. A study published in American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene 
estimated that about 5,800 people were admitted as a result of false information of so on social media. These people died from drinking methanol or alcohol-based cleaning product. They wrongly believed that products such as those cured the virus. And it was not an accident because head of a state had made those comments. The head of the state of an oldest democracy stated that 95% of COVID infections are totally harmless. It is going to disappear one day. It is like a miracle. It will disappear. He further stated multiple times, we're rounding the corner, rounding the final turn, when in fact the number of cases were increasing at alarming level. The head of another state of another country in South America called COVID as little flow and hysteria, again, harming the citizens of those countries because it's very clear that many citizens believed in what the leader said. In India, a comment was made that the vaccine against COVID would be offered for public health use by August 15. Obviously not the right thing to do either in India or in South America or in North America. So you can imagine that the public health and policymakers are not only battling the virus, they're also battling the trolls and the conspiracy theories that push misinformation and undermine the outbreak responses. Slide number six is very quickly gonna show you where we stand today. Next slide, please. This is where we are in the United States as of yesterday, um, I think 2 p.m. India time. Uh, you can see the three distinct peaks, but if you look, remember the 1918, 1919 mortality curves, they dropped between peaks to close to zero and then are dropping here close to zero. The second peak, this is a study from Stanford University, identified 19 rallies by the president contributing to over 30,000 cases and more than 700 deaths. The president himself got infected. We're so fortunate that he bounced back so quickly, but the rallies he conducted after he left the world reads, 46 rallies in 21 days, you would again see a huge increase in the number of cases. I'm not saying that the number of cases increases because of rallies, but that's perhaps one of the important risk factors. So the next slide and the last slide is gonna set up the rest of the discussion, comments first by the, my co-panelist and then answer to the question and answers. By nearly every indicator, the world has regressed. Residual pandemics still prevail. Other diseases still infecting and killing millions. Nearly 40 million people thrown back into extreme poverty. Vaccine coverage has been set back about 25 years. Keep in mind, we are still not finished with the job of immunizing all children in the world through expanded program of immunization. 46% of 105 surveyed countries reported disruption in malaria diagnostics and treatment services. This is as we, have collectively as a global community and as the leaders of the nations identified year 2030 as elimination target. 75% reduction in access to effective antimalarial medicines would spike mortality similar to 2000 level, which will convert in about 700, 770,000 deaths in Sub-Saharan Africa alone. COVID-19 had turned back years of SDG progress, and we're gonna comment on that. Disproportionate impact on poor and vulnerable. Without urgent actions, this health crisis risk is becoming a child rights crisis. So with those comments, um, I would now like uh, Surbi and Joey to have all of us come on the screen, please. 
Um, I would like to invite the panelists to make their comments. Following that, we will then go through question and answer session. I have already received several questions, but those of you in the audience, please share your questions on the chat group and we'll get to those questions. So let me now invite Dr. Faisal Sultan first, if he has dialed in. Uh, yes, he has. Good afternoon, uh, Dr. Sultan. Um, so we Faisal is still on mute, please. Thank you. Um, I think uh, every single thing that you have said resonates, I think, with every single one uh, of us around in one way or the other. I think uh, during this uh, pandemic, a number of uh, quotes, not mine, and uh, old and I think well worn out, but we, uh, I had to sort of fish them out and, and bring them back into four. And one of my favorite ones has been uh, by Admiral Rickover, which is uh, half truths are like half bricks. They can be thrown further. Um, and that I think uh, has been one of the hallmarks uh, of misinformation uh, or disinformation, both, I guess, in some ways uh, in, in this uh, present pandemic. I do feel that um, the, the flurry of information, the whole flood of information that has come our way uh, has bamboozled, confused, and uh, even uh, uprooted our own professionals, people who ought to be more rooted in, in uh, science and in information uh, that was credible, uh, did get swayed by it. Uh, I feel that it is, again, like always, but ever more important in the present situation, uh, crucial to look at data, to look at data critically, um, and to have credible sources of information. It is key for political leaders to actually rely on such sources and on such uh, institutions and individuals uh, who have uh, this credibility and are grounded and rooted in, in, in the science of this. Understandably, things change, uh, and, and even the science of it changes, even the truths change. We must understand that and we you know, must recognize this. Uh, but at the same time, uh, with that idea of remaining tuned to data and information and credibility. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sultan. Um, that's that's a highly appropriate um, commentary you made. Um, uh, it reminds me that the leaders need to be served by the appropriate people. A radiologist uh, cannot be an infectious disease expert overnight and, and advise the president or the prime minister of a nation. Um, Srinath, over to you. You have done a lot of work on this uh, in India and, 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 and are connected with WHO systems as well. So if you could please make your comments. Thank you, Altaf. I think the whole area of misinformation is not something that happens by chance. It happens as a result of systematic design of several vested interests who set that whole thing in motion and derive benefit from it ultimately and people who are gullible fall prey to that whether it is climate change being challenged repeatedly by people who who are have vested interest in perfect global warming or when you look at whether it's deforestation or mining or a variety of other reasons by which uh, fossil fuels are actually propagated and increased and defended. Or whether it's the tobacco industry, whether it is food systems, whether it is the anti-vaxxers who are actually part of an anti-science campaign. But all of these represent some level of vested interest. And you also find that the powers that be also play into this because of their vested interest. For example, the politicians would like to get on with their political activity, with their rallies, with their elections. And then you also find that the call for saying, let us protect livelihoods, not just lives. The economy is suffering. Let's get the economy back on rails. Means that corporate interests are also <coughs> pushing the politicians to say uh, that this particular pandemic is not, not really that serious. It is just a mild flu, so let's get on with our lives. So when we have many of these interests coalescing, 
then you have an opportunity for misinformation to gain ground and anti-science to become a very well-propagated philosophy. So I think it is absolutely important for us to definitely depend upon robust science and ensure that science actually drives policy. But that will not happen unless there is a very strong social movement built, not only in terms of increasing the belief on science, but on countering a number of Western interests who have a stake in perpetuating this kind of misinformation for their gains. So ultimately what you need is people partnered public health, which can contain and combat this kind of misinformation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renat. That's remarkable. Martina, Germany is doing extremely well. Uh, we was, uh, I was watching some uh, news clips yesterday and um, the, the commentator converted Germany's cases and mortality in, with, the, with the United States. And the conclusion was if the United States had followed Germany's uh, uh, strategies, we would have saved 200,000 people in, in the United States. So over to you, Martina, please. Thank you very much, Altaf, um, and good afternoon, and ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation to contribute to this panel discussion on the question what COVID-19 has taught us about healthcare and emergency, emergency response. In my comment, uh, I will focus on the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic on the UN Sustainable Development Goals of the 2030 Agenda that you, Altaf, has, have already mentioned in, in your last slide. But because the overall topic of the summit is related to misinformation and disinformation, the first point uh, that I would like to make is related to data and their importance. So all information that I'm going to share in the next couple of minutes uh, about the implications of the COVID-19 pandemic on the SDGs relies on data. Also in normal times, data are really essential for making informed policy decisions and also for a responsible fact-based media coverage that aims to inform the public. But particularly in times of crisis like the ongoing pandemic, reliable data are crucial for understanding and managing the effects of the pandemic. So in this case, having access to data can save lives. On the other hand, a lack of data is limiting effective responses, policy responses to global challenges like the ongoing pandemic. And it is also limiting efforts to achieve progress on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. With regard to the SDGs, the United Nations point to a serious data gap in terms of geographic coverage and timeliness. For instance, in at least half of the 194 countries that are captured in the Global SDG uh, Indicators Database, the latest data point available for indicators on poverty, on gender equality or on sustainable cities is for the year 2016 or earlier. The lack of data has uh, been aggravated by the COVID-19 pandemic. So due to shifted priorities during the pandemic, field data collection operations have been interrupted in many countries. Particularly in low and middle income countries, funding of national statistical offices have been cut so that many national statistics are lacking the data necessary to monitor progress on the SDGs. But as I was saying, data are essential to tackle the current global health crisis and to accelerate access uh, progress on the sustainable development goals at the same time. So there's, uh, for this reason, there's more investment in data and statistics needed in order to overcome the pandemic and the challenges that remain on the way to reach the goals. But let me come to the implications uh, of the pandemic on the SDGs. The 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development is the United Nations global framework to end poverty and hunger and to enable a dignified life for all people with access to education, healthcare and equal opportunities. The annual UN Sustainable Development Report provides an overview of the world's implementation efforts to date and it highlights areas of progress and areas where more action needs to be taken to ensure that the SDGs are on track. The central message of this year's report with regard to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic is that no area has been spared the effects of the pandemic. Uh, 
the pandemic abruptly disrupted implementation to ma towards many SDGs and in some cases it, had, it has turned back decades of progress. It is affecting the world's poorest and most vulnerable people the most. Other key findings are that the pandemic is likely to push 71 million people back into extreme poverty in 2020, which would be the first rise in global poverty since 1998. Disrupted healthcare and limited access to food and nutrition, nutrition services could result in hundreds of thousands of additional under five year death and tens of thousands of additional maternal death in 2020. And as more families fall into extreme poverty, children in poor and disadvantaged communities are at a much greater risk of child labor, child marriage and child trafficking. The report also states that global gains in reducing child labor are likely to be reversed for the first time in 20 years. With regard to SDG 3 that strives to ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages, the COVID-19 pandemic has interrupted childhood immunization programs in 70 countries. Also, as a result of lockdowns or other containment measures, the prevention and treatment services for non-communicable diseases, like for example, cancer, cardiovascular diseases or diabetes have been severely disrupted so that many people are not receiving the health services and medicines they need. Of course, the pandemic will not only have negative impacts for the healthcare provision, the pandemic will also have adverse effects on other SDGs, like for example, SDG 4, to, which strives to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities. Because of the pandemic, uh, in more than 193 countries, uh, school closures have been implemented so that 90% of all students worldwide were out of school. Or, for example, SDG 5, the SDG that's dealing with gender equality and the empowerment of all women and girls. Here we can see that COVID-19 is intensifying a risk of violence against women and girls and it is widening inequalities between men and women. Another severe implication, the global pandemic is likely to set back progress to end child marriage because of the school closures and the widening poverty uh, so that more girls are at risk to get married before the age, age of 18. This was maybe just a short overview of some implications of the pandemic. Um, of course, the time is not enough to, to provide a co comprehensive picture of all uh, implications. But um, maybe coming back uh, at least uh, on the question what the, the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us with regard to healthcare and emergency response. So um, we have seen that the pandemic has not only adverse effects on health related SDGs, but also on other SDGs like the education or gender equality SDG, which demonstrates once again the interconnectedness of all the SDGs. So the goals are indivisible and uh, integrated. Negative consequences for one SDG will also strongly impact other SDGs. And we have seen that the COVID-19 pandemic has in a very short period of time destroyed development successes that have been achieved uh, over the last years or even decades. And this has revealed how fragile and vulnerable achievements and development efforts are. And, and it has also revealed the need for more resilience against public health crisis, for more international cooperation and coordination in order to better manage future global health crisis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Martina. That's, that's remarkable. And we're going to have some questions come up where uh, you might be able to address some of other uh, issues. Um, Simon, over to you. Uh, you're in UK. A few months ago, you were in um, my neighborhood and you work out of Abu Dhabi. So you got three uh, geographies, distinct geographies. Uh, UK just went to control lockdown again. Could you share with us uh, what you're seeing on the ground and also from Glide perspective with the last mile challenge? When you started as a CEO, we didn't have the pandemic filter. Now you got pandemic filter. How is it impacting um, Glide's missions uh, and objectives? 
thanks, Altaf. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, just let me start by saying a couple of words uh, and listening to these excellent presentations and, and, and conversations. You know, what have we learned quickly? I think the first thing I'm going to say is we were not ready despite multiple warnings and decades of warnings that it wasn't a question of if, but when. I don't think we should take for granted that what's happening now will be an effective wake-up call for the future. I think there's a lot of work still to do in terms of learning what now and what next. Let me just give a few words about, about Glide, Altaf, and then a couple of other things. I'll be brief and hopefully go into more detail during the questions. So yes, about a year ago, um, I started in a new role in this Global Institute for Disease Elimination, um, rooted in Abu Dhabi, with a panoramic perspective focused on accelerating the elimination of preventable diseases of poverty. Currently, we're looking at a couple of NTDs, neglected tropical diseases, um, river blindness, onchocerciasis, and lymphatic filariasis, but also malaria and polio. Uh, we're very new. We have a lot to learn, just as we're still learning a lot about COVID. Um, but we want to take a strong partnership approach in our DNA uh, with a vision of a world free of preventable diseases of poverty and a mission to advance global thinking and accelerate progress towards the elimination of diseases. I kind of like to think of it as our role is helping others go further and faster on the road to elimination. And we do this through trying to raise awareness and engagement and that talks to the central issues of information and disinformation and misinformation and the, and the infodemic, um, but also advancing elimination strategies and fostering and scaling um, innovations. Altaf, you and I know each other from the board of the RBM Partnership to End Malaria, and I also sit on the board of Malaria Nomo UK, so I'm delighted to join other malariologists here today. And we've heard about some of the worst case scenario uh, mapping of what um, uh, of what COVID could mean. I remember talking to the head of, of the Global Malaria Program at WHO maybe a decade and a half ago, uh, and he used the expression, you can lose a decade of progress in a season. Well, the you know, worst case scenario is we could lose two decades in 10 months. Now, it's not looking like it's that bad, but that fragility is there. COVID has had a profound effect on all our lives and unprecedented in so many dimensions. And we are still learning. We have still a lot of learning to do. Um, Martini, you were talking about the SDGs. The SDGs talk about leaving no one behind. COVID is leaving more behind every day. It's exposed vulnerabilities and has widened the gaps between the rich and the poor. In the early days, people were saying this could be the great equalizer because we were seeing this disease spread rapidly around developed economies. But we know that is not the case. We know this, uh, this, this hurts the poorest and the most marginalized in all countries, in all geographies, um, the most. Um, uh, it's causing more neglect, not less neglect. Um, there is potentially uh, an opportunity for more focus on global health. I've seen a statistic to say we have a 40% increase in enrollments in schools of public health um, uh, across the US. So there may be interest that is sparked, but again, as I say, don't take it for granted. It's why we and Glide are sort of embarking on further COVAX advocacy, advocacy for the COVAX facility, both self-financing and the advanced market commitment, because we know that a more equitable distribution of <coughs> will lead to a more rapid elimination uh, and control of, of you know of this disease and we have economic analysis done by the Eurasia group that say it's better for economies than taking a me first uh, 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 nationalistic approach to, to to vaccines so I'm delighted to join you all today I'm looking forward to the questions and and, 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 and answers and uh, uh, and uh, uh, thanks once again for the invitation thank you Alta Thank you thank you so much Simon sir to have the malaria transition uh, over to you uh, you yes. you sit uh, in Singapore. Singapore has done extremely well as far as COVID is concerned. The mortality rates are amongst the lowest. Yeah. Uh, so they suddenly did something well and started doing early on. And they when they had an issue, they came back and started doing the right things. Uh, if you could share us uh, with us uh, that perspective, but also the malaria piece that you had yes. out of Appleton. Yes. So. If I may, I will definitely get to the malaria piece, um, but I, I just wanted to uh, perhaps take a bit of, I, I've been, first of all, it's a, very much an honor to be part of this group and have appreciated um, so much of what has been shared. And I, I wanted to 
just take a minute to put a, a slight alternate perspective vis-a-vis -vis thinking about the misinformation and the topic and, and, and how communication and what, what we, what, when we say communication, what the implications of miscommunication are. And what, I, what I've been thinking about as we've been talking here is an experience from being in Sierra Leone um, during the Ebola crisis at a time when one of the key messages that was being shared um, at, a, at a district level was don't, don't, touch, uh, don't touch a dead body. And one of the things that quickly became apparent as that message was being shared, as, as many of you may know, you know that's, that's, a, that's a quite a high risk situation. And it was at the same time when this sacred act of caring for someone who had just passed was so critical. And so how those messages, and then you would say, oh, but make sure you wash your hands and people would keep water. And they would use the same water, but do these sacred acts, which were in um, it, it contradicting the guidance that they were being given. And then those messages changed over time. And in that process, 11,000 people perished. And what I, what I, why I bring that up is that Early on, even in this situation, one of the most critical things that we can do as public health professionals is establish credibility early on. And part of credibility early on and continuing is I think the, uh, the people that speak the loudest at times to people are those who are willing to say on record, this is what we don't know. We don't know actually where people are inquiring this infection. Um, we don't know so much about this disease. And I think that that's a crucial thing in terms of misinformation, credibility early on. And uh, I think the second thing that I, I wanted to quickly share, which is I completely agree with Dr. Reddy's points on the macro forces and yours as well, um, Altaf. I, I, just to put the other side of it in, in, into the equation, the other thing that this is showing us is what we need to be doing in terms of, again, that word communication and capacity to communicate at local levels, at county levels, at subnational levels, because building capacity at those levels for public health management, for communication, um, it, it building a culture where public health professionals at that level are equipped with not just management skills, but communication skills is is the and the ability along with the ability to use data effectively not only at a national level not only at a provincial level but how do we equip those people because whether it's malaria or whether it's covid as we're all seeing or whether it's tb as continues to be the case as simon rightly pointed out it is it is disproportionately the poor who are being affected and so who are the people ultimately who are responsible they're delivering those programs to the poor. They are, the, it's those district health managers, it's those individuals working in civil society organizations with whom we very much need to increase the ability to, uh, to both communicate effectively and, and manage programs. So with that, having, having said that, I think on the malaria piece, um, very quickly, uh, I think we're seeing a very, uh, first of all, it's too, e it's too early to tell and make blanket statements, I think, here in Asia Pacific, based on the data that we're seeing now. We have very different stories in terms of, if you look at the data on malaria from the greater Mekong subregion, it tracks with the exception of Myanmar to things going well on, in terms of falciparum and progress on malaria and progress on COVID. And then at the same time, as we know, we have India or a place like Indonesia, and frankly, Papua New Guinea, which has the most indigenous cases recorded in last year, um, where I think saying that there are 605 cases, I think that was what I had just checked on the Johns Hopkins website, um, I think, you know, again, should be taken for a grain of salt because we don't know what the status is of testing. Uh, the, so, so I think it's too early to say, but I think it is safe to say that, and as we'll probably talk about more, there are major risks to to progress towards malaria, not just elimination, let's start with control in some of those three countries that I mentioned, Indonesia, India, PNG. But the last thing I just wanted to say is that um, I hope we'll continue to talk about this because it comes back to communication and um, misinformation even within, within uh, our 
global health world. And that is creating a false dichotomy between vertical interventions, different public health programs and pandemic preparedness. How do we come together to capture that language in a way that helps people understand where the opportunities are specifically for synergy so that those budgets get protected and the progress doesn't keep backsliding. It's, it's this notion that, you know, in the broader sphere, there may be a message, oh, governments have to pivot to, um, to pandemic preparedness. And then many of us get stuck in the jargon of right. vertical or health system strengthening. And we've got to find a way out of that uh, to be able to, to keep going uh, as a leaders alliance here where I sit, but broadly. Thank you. Thank you, Satak, so much. And if I could uh, let the organizers, Joey, you know that if, if you can give us some more time, um, that will be appreciated. So let me now go to the questions. I've already gotten some questions. Some are coming. Um, if each one of you had to advise your prime ministers or your heads of states to do it right, because we're still in pandemic, uh, what would your recommendation be and what would your clear direction be? So short uh, responses, Srinath, to you first. Uh, the uh, associated question that has come up uh, through WhatsApp is, are some countries fudging the data? They're not reporting as much. The question is, we see many people sit in our neighborhoods, yet they don't get reported in the systems. So if we had to do it all over again to help politicians understand COVID is a public health problem. It needs public health solutions. What would their message should not be you? And then Faisal, I'll go to you, please. Well, uh, I think the message that it needs to go out very clearly to all politicians and policymakers is that. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we yeah. can. Uh, the message that needs to go out very clearly to all politicians and policymakers is that. So, Faisal, let me go to you. Srinath is having some um, audio issues. So, over to you, Faisal, please. Right. So, that question for me is not theoretical. It, this is what I have been doing for the last many months. Um, our advice should be and has been uh, that we need to continuously look at data as it comes through to improve the quality and flow of data, to have constant analysis of it and very critical analysis of it, and to use this data as well as uh, additional information that comes through for forward planning. Um, and there are a number of examples in our case where we were able to uh, forecast, predict, and prepare uh, for things that were to come. Uh, and to really remain completely uh, married to the idea that our responses needed to be uh, re reactive and responded uh, responsive to the information that was coming through. One of the important lessons for us, at least in Pakistan, for all this, uh, was to make sure that we uh, looked at data in our context. We analyzed it, we looked at it, and we were critical on many of the base assumptions for many projections and information that was coming out from very leading institutions, uh, but which held the potential for tremendous, uh, uh, you know, despite being academically grounded, uh, but held the potential for a tremendous uh, impact or negative impact on your um, the, on the decisions that you made and, and, and eventually into public life. So I think um, the, the focus on clear, data flow, the right people to analyze and look at it, and then the right arms, uh, the outbound arms to actually ensure that what was being advised was being actually done uh, and a little ground truthing of it. I think that's that's been at least the crux of the response in Pakistan, and this is what we've been advising on. Thank you. Faisal, uh, the next question was actually complimenting Pakistan for what it did, um, given the difficult situations the Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister had, as many leaders had. And the question was, would Pakistan write a paper as soon as possible and have rest of the nations learn more details, a, a paper that will go into different, different aspects of policy program and political leadership 
Um, there was a comment made in the United States. If the United States had followed Pakistan's strategy, we would have saved about a trillion dollars in our economy. So this is complimenting Pakistan. If you could please uh, answer this question. Thank you. So yes, a paper is in the works. You should see one shortly. Um, but that's a summary paper. That's really a summary and, and uh, somewhat uh, you know information from a sort of a 30,000 foot view. We do uh, intend to and need to actually put out uh, more details of uh, what we have been uh, all up to. Uh, thank you. This is very kind. But I would uh, caution. I would say, well, you know, we've done well so far. Uh, but are we right in the midst of our second wave? And um, many things that we learned in the first wave are operative and important today. But there are many things that we need to yet learn and redo. Uh, because having the first pandemic with its own set of fears and, uh, and uh, information and misinformation that it carried, uh, we're now into the second phase where there is almost nihilism. Uh, in our society about the existence of it, or or there is a certain um, tiredness, if you will, uh, of um, following instructions. So therefore, the challenges this time around uh, are, are even bigger, I think, in many ways. While we are better prepped, uh, we need different means and modes of risk communication to our public. Otherwise, we run the risk of losing many of the gains that we made the first time around. Thank you so much. Simon, the question, um to you next, and Srinath, if you can also answer that, that'll be great. Uh, the question is, how do public health professionals respond when the masses tend to listen to politicians, and if the politicians aren't being honest, people suffer? How do we correct this suffering? So it, it links a little bit to that question around uh, what advice would you give to um, to leaders and administrations and and the recognition that these are tough jobs. Um, the answers aren't straightforward, particularly with incomplete information and, and, and continued learning and the need to balance multiple um, uh, factors in this. And, and too often it seems to have been um, equated to binary um, decisions. We'll lock down, we'll open up. Um, we'll, um, uh, uh, you know, take d different approaches to how we may con con control this. And, you know, it, it seems to me that, that, that politics without the science and, and, and data will, will not give us an optimal solution. Um, but equally, public health data and information without a recognition and understanding that it needs to be used um, uh, differently is, 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 uh, is, is equally going to be suboptimal. Um, Unfortunately, I think perhaps the, the, the data, the evidence, the science itself has been politicized um, and it's tended to, 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 to make these binary decisions, including sort of government interference versus personal freedom. So when you think about mask wearing, I understand the cultural challenges. I mean, Ten months ago if you, or, or a year ago, if you'd said throughout Western Europe and North America, you'd see the proportion of people wearing face masks. You, you you would have thought this was ridiculous. You think back to countries that have done well. There's 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 a muscle memory and a practice makes perfect approach there that they've been able to draw on. It's very new and it's very alien and it has been politicized. And I think simply mandating, while it sounds straightforward, is very difficult because getting compliance from 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 large parts of the population is really is really difficult. Look, I think a, a big hero of mine is is is, is Anthony Fauci. Um, I think he's done a remarkable job in very difficult circumstances in in the U.S. Uh, I, I also used to work with Chris Whitty, the chief medical officer in the U.K. Super smart, incredibly uh, 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 professional people uh, with with masses of integrity, and and yet you're seeing the politicization of some of some of their work, not the, the misinformation infodemic that we live in. So the response has to be balanced. Um, the public health professionals are that they are professionals. They do their jobs. They often put themselves at incredible personal risks to do these jobs, and it is crucial that their voices get heard. So I think it's, um, uh, you know, they have to shout, they have to shout loud. The, the challenge is how you build trust and confidence in the population, because I think just mandating doesn't actually work. Um, so you have to find ways of doing that. And I would just say there were three examples that, that I thought were really interesting. One was well, face masks that we've just talked about. The other is testing. Um, uh, I, I, 
you know, there have been more tests for COVID developed over the last 10 months than tests for all neglected tropical diseases over the last century. And yet we still don't have suitable test and trace uh, architecture in, in much of the, of, of the world. Uh, and then finally, denialism. We do know that when leaders downplay or deny the severity of a disease, we know that it, it, it spreads. And you know, public health professionals have a, a duty to, to, to shout when that's the case. We saw it from the HIV AIDS pandemic, those countries where you had leadership, uh, those countries where they accepted it, those countries where they balanced the very difficult challenges around economy and, uh, and, and around the, the science of epidemiology. They made more progress. So I think that's the, that's the challenge that all public health officials have uh, today. Thank you, Simon. The next question is a straightforward question. I would like to get a vote here from the sample size is six, but uh, sample size from diverse cultures, nations. Um, United States pulled out of WHO at a critical time when WHO needed support from member nations. The question is, was it a right decision? Second question is, the incoming Biden administration, should they on day one resign their commitment, the pledge, and support for WHO. So if I can get yes or no first, and then perhaps Srinath, if you can comment on that, because you just wrote an editorial on this. So uh, Faisal, over to you. What would your recommendation be personal or on part of the Pakistan government of Pakistan? You're muted, uh, Faisal. Yeah, apologies. Um, yeah, so I think um, a country at the helm of the scientific uh, world and so so uh, overwhelmingly large in terms of contribution to so many scientific developments in the recent time, I think ought to be really at the helm of the WHO as well. So I think it would be the right decision for the United States to be fully engaged uh, with the World Health Organization. To me, it's a no brainer. Thank you so much, Martina. Yes or no? Yes, I absolutely agree. I think it's the right decision for the, the new uh, government of the United States to join WHO again. And it is, was also already a statement that President-elect Joe Biden has made in, in July that, in his opinion, uh, the Americans are safer when the United States or the health care system uh, provision is safer for the, the U.S. citizens when the United States are members of the WHO. Thank you so much. And for those uh, listening to us or, or watching us, WHO isn't a place where some unique or things happen without informa information back and forth. WHO is made of people like sitting on this panel. They're from the United States, they're from England, they're from Pakistan, they're from Africa, they're from all over. They bring the collective scientific public health wisdom to global public health problems. Srinath, you connected with WHO. Um, you wrote about it. You wrote about Biden administration incoming, what your recommendation would be. Uh, if you could please uh, give us your word. Well, uh, I believe it's absolutely important for the Biden administration to re-enter United States into the WHO. Uh, firstly, as you said, WHO belongs to the world. It's the lead public health agency. Of course, the techno bureaucrats there are essentially taking their mandate from the World Health Assembly, which consists of the member countries. Therefore, there's no point in blaming the WHO techno bureaucrats for whatever policies. It's ultimately all the nations collectively together that are steering the policies. But what is very important is for us to recognize that in a globalized world, whether it is a pandemic or even the domino effect of a collapsing economy, we are all in it together. The impact of economic instability anywhere, and particularly of infectious diseases and pandemics anywhere, is likely to affect the entire world. Therefore, no country is safe till every country is safe, even in the context of COVID. Therefore, we need to be in it together and support each other. Otherwise, we are going to get this pandemic recycling all over again from countries which have not been assisted or helped, and even the countries which have done well will again get re-affected. And this will happen for any other pandemic as well. 
But I think it's absolutely important as we support each other and that we forget things like vaccine nationalism, that we actually provide a global trust to counter this global threat. But in the process of re-entry, the United States must also recognize that it should be quite respectful of the concerns and the priorities of other countries and the tendency sometimes that exists among the globalists in the United States to be very prescriptive to other countries, that should be eschewed. I think the respectful conduct and involving everybody on that plane of mutual consultation, which uh, President-elect Biden has promised in the political life of the United States, that must be the spirit that must also enter global health where we all sit together and in a mutually consultative manner and a mutually respectful manner, decide what is the ideal way to go forward. But certainly the WHO needs to be strengthened and supported, even if it needs to be reformed. Thank you. Thank you, Srinath. And, and in, in uh, full uh, recognition of the contribution the United States has made, it led the fight against HIV AIDS. And, and Simon, you, you were part of that. Um, we have the most effective contribution from U.S. governments through President's Malaria Initiative. Um, so we had to United States, CDC, Global Disease Detection and uh, FASL and in Islamabad, uh, the EIS program uh, through CDC and in India as well in many parts of the world. So United States was a contributor, a leader, a collaborator. And that got missed in the last four years. Simon, over to you and then to Sir Tak. I need the vote because I need to conclude this. This be part of question with a uh, vote on Biden on day yeah. one of the presidency. He, should he do an executive order re-entering WHO? Uh, thank you, Altaf. Short answer, yes. Um, uh, the US has played a remarkable role in global health. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, President's Malaria Initiative, et cetera, that you talked about. It's also American science has helped lead the way in part on, on, on vaccine development. So it, it's hugely important. Um, yes, the, the, the answer is he should he should invest. But, but I'd say three quick things. First of all, we have to do a better job of proving why multilateral cooperation um, is the right approach. Um, we have to find ways of countering the, we'll, we'll do this ourselves us first. We, we have to be better at demonstrating the, 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 the value addition there. Secondly, WHO is big and complicated with 193 member states. Um, it's not perfect. Um, so the Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness by Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and Helen Clark with support from Anders Nordstrom is, is really important and it will need reform. Uh, but we've said that before, but, but you know, we, we America is better inside to push for that reform rather than outside. And the final point is again this 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 pull away from multilateralism and cooperation. The um, the Covax facility, this this CEPI, WHO, and Gavi led mechanism to try and ensure that actually we make everybody safe. Because if 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 everybody isn't safe, no one is safe. Uh, uh, um, Dr. Reddy's comment is is crucially important. And so um, you know, I I, I urge all of you to advocate strongly for, for a multilateral approach to getting the vaccines delivered where they need to be. Thanks, Alta. Thank you, Simon. Uh, Sir a uh, short comment from you. I'm getting a uh, cue from the organizers. Yes. We have time for two more questions. I wanted to say two questions, actually. Yep. <laughs> yes, it's an absolute yes. There's nothing more to add except the statement that it makes is that as somebody who is part of the diaspora in, in Indian, Indian America, America saying it's in the WHO is a reflection of the real value of what America is, because there's no one definition of what an American is, other than that spirit of cooperation. And so it's without question, and reform is necessary of some kinds, much of what um, Simon and others have mentioned, but unequivocally, yes. Thank you so much. So the next question is on the positive side, um, Pfizer and Moderna, have recently, a few days ago, announced um, the efficacy data, which is touching 90 plus percent, which is good news in the shortest possible time. And Simon, you know this better. Um, uh, historically, uh, for a vaccine to go reach the stage, it has taken seven to 10 years. Malaria vaccine is an example. Um, I started my career starting working on malaria vaccine research 
and we don't have a malaria vaccine yet. Uh, assuming that the vaccine is going to be efficacious in the context of um, its impact on infection and disease and the duration of protection, um, what should happen for entire world to have access to it, either vaccine developed in the United States, uh, China, Russia, India, Brazil. Um, Faisal, you're working with uh, Chinese companies. Um, if you could please uh, share your views and then Simon, I'll go to you. Right, I think I'll echo what Dr. Reddy said. Uh, I think he just signed off. But what he said was very simple, that uh, we all collectively need to be safe. This, this game cannot be played in isolation. And I think uh, uh, so long as we continue to look at it in isolation, we'll end up uh, in a worse situation than we are. So I think that uh, if one is to look at the broad strategy of this, it has to center around access, equitable access, and access that actually makes sense and is prioritized to those that require it first uh, all across the globe. Within Pakistan, but this is exactly what we are trying to do. Uh, we obviously cannot uh, plant a billion dollars each in the, the, the accounts of uh, the five, six, seven major developers. Uh, but what we are trying to do is make sure that we have identified who we are going to deploy it first, and then to make a sensible choice on uh, which vaccine to bet on. On the Chinese uh, vaccine that we are involved with, our trial is ongoing. We've completed about two thirds of the enrollment. And it's going well, and we hope that we will be able to contribute to this knowledge base to, to, to help yet another option come uh, to the market and to the world. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Simon, uh, before you answer, vaccine success depends on program more than vaccine being available. It to reach to the people who need it the most, uh, who should get it the first, and are the systems in play uh, Pfizer's construct uh, needs minus 100 degrees uh, storage condition. That may not exist. That may not exist in the United States. Um, so uh, can you comment on the programmatic aspects of last mile, last person in village and district, wherever they are, to get the vaccine? Thanks, Altaf. So I agree uh, uh, um, wholeheartedly with, with Dr. Sultan. The, the distribution is hugely important. I, I remember, and you talked about the time it takes to develop a vaccine. I remember the advanced market commitment for pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. Um, through that advanced market commitment, we short circuited at least a decade of development by getting a vaccine uh, available to poor people without going through a long, a long process. We've seen some similar innovations in production of, of the new candidates now, Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca has announced uh, um, interim uh, um, uh, 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 results, and it's looking it's looking positive. But but the logistics of this are incredibly hard. So the first thing is a facility that recognizes that more equitable distribution to the vulnerable first is the right path to protecting everyone, rather than doing the rich first and the easiest first. That's the first challenge you've got to make, and the, 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 the COVAX facility and AMC is designed to do that. The second is the program side and the logistics of delivering it um it maybe sounds facile but it's 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 it is just logistics it can be done we've done it with ebola we we can put in place mechanisms and innovations now moderna needs i, I think a half the temperature minus 20 or something so you know we're seeing new developments that, that, that come out i'm absolutely confident this can be done and this can be delivered i don't think it's legitimate to say because you need such low temperatures we can't possibly think about doing this in rural difficult places in africa that was the argument they used to use around antiretroviral therapy for hiv aids you can't do it in africa it's too difficult of course we can it might cost more but we have the innovations, we have the technology, we have the wherewithal. So we must not use that as an excuse to say that these 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 difficult last miles are really a little bit out of out of bounds. That that cannot be the case. Thank you, Thank you Simon. Um, I have a question about polio elimination in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And Faisal, the question is: with the challenges you all had, diverting efforts and resources and on COVID management from public health perspective. Um, did it impact uh, the, the fight against polio? First, um, I, I think you all deserve in Pakistan to be congratulated. As India uh, was congratulated when India uh, got rid of polio, you're very close to it. But has, has 
COVID posed problems uh, in Pakistan or Afghanistan? It did. Um, I think the first broad lockdown uh, interrupted um, campaigns, and I think it certainly did impact. Um, paradoxically and interestingly and ironically, I think, um, it was indeed the polio program, the network of the polio program, as well as its database, that was actually uh, marshaled into service. And that really truly helped us to uh, power up our response to COVID. So, uh, you know, interestingly, while whatever the goods and strengths of the polio network and program were, while it still hasn't been able to sort of finally, you know, clean it out of the system and, and you know, we're struggling with it, yet that's exactly what sorted uh, COVID out. But the COVID program, I think, is now going to give the gift back to the polio program that whatever coherence and data-driven decision-making we learned out of there is going to be fed back into the polio program. And I think uh, when we look back a year from now, we will say, aha, this was truly an aha moment. And uh, it is the COVID experience that will finally uh, put the nail in, in uh, the coffin of the polio, uh, you know, uh, existence in, in Pakistan. Thank you. Remarkable, remarkable. These are the lessons learned in real time and put to use. Um, Shinath, um, I would like to ask you and Martina the next question and the last question uh, from two different geographies. Strict lockdowns have made it hard or impossible to access routine immunization. Um, and that poses a problem. It exposes a cohort uh, of children to disease or infection a year, two years down the road. What would your recommendation be uh, to manage this important piece of childhood immunization in India? And Martina, you sitting in Germany where you've done similar but less intense lockdowns, what your recommendation would be? Enough to you first, please. Well, fortunately, I think the lockdowns have ended in India and we are not going to see the reimposition of the lockdown. And we will be seeing most likely only micro containment measures where we are going to see. In so, um, uh, Martina, let me go to you. Srinath is having connectivity issues. Uh, Yes, thank you. I think childhood immunization programs are essential and there shouldn't be any um, shifting of these kind of uh, medical prevention measures. So um, as long as it is possible to provide health care in a, a comprehensive manner, also during lockdown situations and also maybe um, with regard to other health care priorities, they should should of course take place and with regard to the German side I don't have any uh, knowledge that they have been um, disrupted uh, in the current situation so um, we have a lockdown since uh, the, at the beginning of uh, November a kind of soft lockdown but uh, still healthcare provision of course uh, and uh, business are, are running uh, schools and keters are open so I don't think there's any disruption at the moment here uh, with regard to childhood immunization programs. Thank you so much. Sertak, the last question of the session, it comes to you uh, from uh, someone in Delhi. He's saying that more people have died from dengue than COVID um, in Singapore. He's saying, is this true? Um, and if it is, how grave is that situation? Um, before you answer, uh, let me also mention here the reason Singapore had lower deaths in, due to COVID is because Singapore introduced an effective program um, where they put the systems together. But um, Sita, over to you about dengue. I don't know the exact data, but I don't think, I, would, I think it was about 28 people died from dengue in, as of October in this year. Um, probably that's right. I, the COVID number is not at the top of my, um, not at the top of my head right now. Um, but um, I, you know, I think it's a fair point. I mean, frankly speaking, I think the, the most important takeaway in terms of what you described about Singapore and, I, and just you know, on that contrast that you opened with in terms of the US and here, what is it here? I mean, having been in the, U, in the US before I came here um, during the first wave, it, it fundamentally is you know, about, I, I 
about people's willingness to think in a collective way, <laughs> right? Not only to follow rules, but to care about each other and, and, and be willing to make the sacrifice that's necessary so that we can all, I mean, nothing that no one on this panel or no one listening in doesn't know, but it is remarkable to see it in practice. Um, it's not that complicated. <laughs> it, it's really a question of commitment and willingness to care for each other um, and make sacrifices, certainly. I mean, yes, it's easier, it's 5 billion people, but I think there's some fundamentals there that if you could build them at a county level in the US, you could do a lot. Right. Well, thank you so much. I want to thank each one of you again. Faisal, to you. You are driving into Lahore for, for joining us today. Martina, you, Simon, Sirtak, and Srinath Reddy. This has been an extremely useful conversation, and we were able to answer many of the questions that came our way. Thank you again. Let me pass it back to Surbi. Uh, Surbi, for you to please conclude the session.